so um, that was a, uh, a, a jazz improvisation, a kind of invention. I mean, certainly there's invention that happens first. It's on the page. It's worked out. It took me a few, uh, several hours, maybe over a couple of days, to write this piece of music, because I, I don't really remember writing it, to be honest. Um, and then there was this kind of spontaneous stuff using this extant form and so forth. Uh, there's something uh, I'd like to actually um, show you what I'm infatuated with here, if I remember. It's this funny idea, because it's just a third melodically, and then... So it's just this third plank, which I think is very funny, like to be like, you know, it's like, wait, do you have any other ideas? In this? You know, just like, that's it, right? And then, now it presses out from a third half step in each direction, that now the intervallic ambitus is a tritone, going to the second line, minor six, minor seven, and then a hiccup there to get to the octave, because the octave is funny, and we were taught not to write any of them, ever, you know? No, I don't know. And um, so, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm playing with this third that descends, which basically starts on C, and then we have a pickup to the next one, and then I introduce the triplet. So we're going to have the top part of that third. It's written like a diminished fourth, actually. And then we're going to uh, descend again. But then we have our first ascent, and then a descent. And now when we get to the fourth bar, instead of just that, I'm going to play that as a, uh, uh, as a uh, augmented triad. So it's a stack of two major thirds. And then the pushing outward, as I mentioned. So you have... There's a reason why I can't play in the downbeat here, and that's this octave. So there's this, you know, it's like a new music moment, <laughs> where it's like nobody plays on the downbeat, and everyone, ha everyone now someone has to breathe, and then the audience is increasingly in danger of being asphyxiated as like the ensemble sucks all the air out of the room in order to play new music. But, okay. And then we go to ninth, and then we're oscillating seventh, with ninth. And then this descending pattern of, tri of tritone separated by a third. And then we have this octave plus a tritone. And then. So, really, what I'm doing is I'm just making uh, a chromatic ascent to here. And then once we get to here, I'm. C4 and widening out to two octaves. This is, uh, you're looking glazed, like why did you have to analyze that? That's dumb. We came here to learn about chord songs or I don't know what. But the thing is, like that appeals to me as like a schema, a schema of sorts, evidently. And it's, and it's very composerly in some regard. Okay, but the important thing is while this was an invention, there are some things that I didn't invent. I did not invent the piano. Um, and then some other things. I didn't invent diatonic, tonal, torsion, harmony, the jazz idiom, swing rhythms, etc. Much as you might have thought. Thank you for inventing jazz, mm -hmm. Professor Applebaum. No, I didn't. But the fact that I didn't, that I leaned on extant culture, I wonder, I muse, uh, will make this a kind of a rhetorical question that will evade its answer for now. Does this make me less autonomous? Because I didn't create the entire cultural surround in which this music exists. So. Let me change instruments and tell you about another instrument that I play. Um, that's this instrument, the mousetrap, which I invented in 1990. It's made of junk and hardware and found objects mounted on electroacoustic soundboards. They're played with knitting needles and chopsticks and wind-up toys and violin bows and plectra. Here's the mini mouse and the duplex mouse phone. The mini mouse, which I'll mention in the context of Sinbad, has a five-pin din jack in the upper right corner. I don't know if you can see that. And it's, a, it's wired to nothing. It's just sort of a comment on the optimism of electronic music. <laughs> um, when I was living in Copenhagen, I was like welding these things I called ham trees. This is like bronze brazing rod twisted into weird shapes. They make great gong like sounds. Um, here's the Mouseketeer, T I E R. It's a three tiered, three level instrument. Um, 
Yeah, and I play it with all sorts of live electronics. I prefer like old hardware, sometimes analog, digital things. Um, here, just to give you an idea of what this sounds like, here's a, a passage, a short passage with four kinds of articulatory moments. First, I'm going to pluck a nail, and then I'm going to stroke the nails, secondly, with a, uh, a chopstick, and then I'm going to uh, rotate two galvanized steel wheels, very squeaky ones, and then I'm going to drag my thumbs along the teeth of different cones. Here we go. And now let's hear that same passage again, but with one of an infinite number of available digital signal processy kinds of setups that I can use to warp the sound. So I like these, uh, the idea of having this sort of acoustic sort of quality or this electroacoustic quality with just a straight amplification with these cheap piezo contact pickups and I like the ability to sort of dial in uh, a small or large degree of this sort of warping um, electronic intervention. These instruments are at Carleton College right now in this exhibit, mostly about my notation, but the sound sculptures are there now. And so I just took some pictures before I left this week of just to show you what's exciting is I got to choose the color of the plinth. First I got to learn I got to learn what a plinth is. <laughs> and then um, here are the uh, the two kinder mouse sculptures that I made for my daughter's elementary school some years back. Um, so here, but here's the thing I want you to know about the Mouseketeer. I am the world's best Mouseketeer player. So <laughs> that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, now the the thing the thing that, that's, that's humorous to say, um, but the thing that's important is I'm also realizing that I'm the world's worst Mouseketeer player. And this is quite a bit different than my relationship to the piano, where there's some billion practitioners and I'm sort of somewhere in the middle of a whole bunch of people playing a whole bunch of quite similar instruments, or uh, uh, you know, more or less copies of trying to do the same thing, whereas my instruments are one of a kind. So I'm work the Mouseketeer, in a sense, is working in a space that is a culture of one, and that's different. So the Musketeer is also an invention. It's a, something that I actually made in my garage. But here are some things that I, and some things I did invent. So where I had to point out some of the things I didn't invent, the piano, tonal harmony, jazz, etc. I did invent this instrument, and I invented, you know, I, I cultivated, curated this particular timbre reservoir that I wanted. Um, it, it, I, I've made what I would call idiomatic instrumental technique. I'm really interested in designing the ergonomics of how the body functions in space, all the specific hybrid electronic pairings, and so forth. And then we can again ask this rhetorical question, does this make me more autonomous? Do I have more uh, creative, imaginative autonomy as a consequence of building my own tool? So let's call this, in a sense, cultural, uh, this cultural autonomy. Let's call, it, call this aut autonomy type one. I even wonder, is this desirable? Is it desirable to be functioning in a space where you are simultaneously the best and worst of the thing because there are not other exemplars? So here is my concerto for florist and orchestra, which I believe is the, both the best and worst of this kind of uh, <laughs> enterprise. Uh, here's just a little clip. Let's watch. You've got the orchestra playing. And then there's James Del Prince, um, a performance florist. <laughs> He's actually a, a regular florist, but I asked him, I, I met him actually, we were sitting next to each other on an airplane in 1999, and I said, I immediately had this idea for this piece, like instantly, and I said, have you ever thought about being a performance florist? And he said, I've always dreamed of being a performance florist. <laughs> he was like really into it. And so we've done this piece largely with various ensemble versions, and this is the lone sort of uh, orchestral version. Here's another piece that I composed that's probably, you know, in its own sort of genus in a sense. So here's just a little bit from a piece from graduate school called Tun after the Borges short story for uh, three conductors and no players. And so this is actually based on the 
experience of watching two people having a, a very aggressive argument in sign language that produced no decibels to speak of, but to me as a viewer was affectively a loud, psychologically loud experience. And so I started thinking about what are the kinds of things, what are the typical musical parameters we think of that could be expressed in ocular and visual terms rather than in aural ones. And you know, I think about how uh, architects and visual artists talk about rhythm all the time. And we can think about this sound. So here's the polyrhythm of five against three. And we can think about what does it look like in a five beat pattern against three. And so this is, is and is not the same as and I think those kinds of cross-modal or sensory kinds of uh, translations are uh, fascinating. And um, you get new things, you impoverish some attributes, and you augment others in some ways. Uh, worthy of exploration, I think. Anyway, in notation, I do a lot of very conventional things. I, I do all my uh, scores by hand. Uh, that's uh, There's a... A long story about that. Here's a piano piece. Here's a, a solo guitar piece. Um, so it's very conventional kind of approaches to, um, you know, sort of contemporary idioms. Uh, chamber orchestra piece. You have these things here suddenly where the players are equipped with these spinners. In let's see, that's like bar 39 or bar 40, and they they have to spin these spinners, which tell them what pitch to play on the next bar. And the conductor has like a, a loudness one too, so it's going to be soft or loud or something. So it's just kind of this indeterminate element that happens. Here we have a bar that's repeated, uh, bar 34 is repeated x plus one times. X is the number of times it takes three or more players in the ensemble to stand up and protest. So you have this potentially infinitely recursive moment in this chamber orchestra piece of 14 players until it's socially mediated by three people. So that's going to be different every time. Um, an earlier piece, when I was living in Copenhagen, I took the Copenhagen subway system and I renamed all the stations to abstract musical provocations, and the players follow the timetables, and they're synchronized with stopwatches, and so they're, these are minutes past the hour, and so they're, they're coordinated in that regard. And then, increasingly, I started writing these pictographic scores, and the sort of the big one was this project that I made called the Metaphysics of Notation, uh, which is 72 feet long. It was displayed at the Cantor Arts Center uh, at, on the Stanford campus who commissioned it for almost a year. And it was experienced as visual art all year long, um, even though I don't think of myself as a visual artist. Um, and then, but on Fridays at noon, various interpreters would realize it and found, and there's no instruction whatsoever for how to interpret these glyphs, which are, the 72 feet is chopped into 12, uh, 12 six foot wide by 10 inch tall panels that are installed between uh, the pillars around the sort of atrium. And so you have all sorts of various players. There's Eric Ullman. You'll recognize some Bay Area uh, uh, mu new music luminaries, but all sorts of people from around the world came actually to play this. And that was very exciting as almost a, a, a musical project and in a sense a social project to find out what it was that this score meant. And of course, there is a certain kind of crisis of authorship because my name goes on the program as the composer of this piece, but they're doing all the heavy lifting since I deliberately composed this with no sound in my head, which is that kind of reckless thing. We're taught to firmly imagine the sound and then the notation is considered good. And here's a, there's burnt score fragments and a sort of mobile. The notation is considered successful to the extent that some performer could interpret it and recreate that imagined sound. But what does it mean when you're doing a project where you don't imagine the sound at the beginning? So here's one, one panel I want to show you. And you see there's a certain kind of visual rhetoric, a certain visual logic that metamorphoses. And things become other things. And by the way, the music tree, if you have music, all music, it's either staying the same or it's changing at any given moment. That's what's happening in music. And if it's changing, it's either changing suddenly or gradually. So this thing, I just this is all of music I just diagrammed for you, right? <laughs> and so I think about these things like when is it abrupt and when is it slightly changing and when is it metamorphosing and, and then of course you have notions of recurrence which are interesting. If we take the next pat the next um, the next panel, what you can see is that this panel would have been installed off that way, so they would be horizontally distributed. And what you can see in the first panel is some stuff happening. You can, let's see if my cursor shows up here. You see like, you have this kind of like sinusoidal curve 
with these sort of circular forms that get larger, but they also sort of dematerialize. And then here, they kind of rematerialize um, in the next panel, but they're and, and get smaller and get more concrete, but they're also in this rectilinear space now, this sort of orthogonal thing rather than a circular one. Um, so there is that kind of horizontal continuity, and then the, the rhetoric from this pattern goes to the next. And if we were to put the, the last glyph of panel 12 back in front of the first glyph of panel 1, you'd see they're actually precisely the same. So it actually forms a loop, in a sense. The 12 panels, I call them 1 through 12, but they're just a circular thing, and you could start anywhere and, and go anywhere you want, play as much or as little as you want. But what I'd like to point out is by stacking them, you can also notice that you have this sort of like shield-like thing that's descending in, the, in that top panel, and it inverts over in the next panel and, and is seen upside down, and then you have these little st st stalactites and stalagmites that are coming, jutting up uh, above and below this sort of diagonal, and this one happens to line up precisely here. So here's the line between these panels. So you can see if you were to take this top panel and stack it above the next panel, there's continuities, there's ways that the square can be read in the vertical dimension as well. And similarly here we have this sort of tulip looking thing and these weird dangly hockey stick things or whatever and across that line. So and if you took the 12th panel and stacked it on top of the first panel, the continuity works that way. So it rotates also in the vertical dimension, which mathematicians tell me is a torus. I don't know. I like mathematicians. Like I'm walking through a forest. <laughs> and there's a bunch of mathematicians. They're all standing there. And then they say, they bellow, in, like in unison, you have made a Taurus. Or I don't know. I just, you know a, a mathematician told me that. Do you, have you lived with these like in your house like or just around you? And have they changed over the year or since you've had them, since you first made them? Have they changed like, in, in your materially? interpretation? <laughs> I'm sorry? In your interpretation of them, like sonically. Here, thank you for the question, but I should tell you that I don't interpret them purposely. So this is one piece of mine that I'm not, I forbid myself to play because I don't want to suggest some sort of authorial precedent. So, but um, it's now installed at Carleton College and we've had a run of three weekly events that have been mind blowing to me because there have been new ways of thinking about that I never thought of. And then we had an event in the art center there in five, five, five simultaneous concerts that are going on that are 10 minutes long each starting on the 15 minutes, and audiences are split into five groups with an usher who guides them, and you progress so that over an hour and 15 minutes, you get to hear all five concerts. So the, the, the musicians stay put in one place and give repeat, inter repeat performances, but repeat, sometimes it, they may try to make it exactly the same, and sometimes it will be wildly different. We had a quartet of, of like kind of famous uh, Twin City uh, interpreter, uh, um, new music kind of royalty playing in one room. We had the Carlton Choir in another room, but we had like a j kind of a jazz combo with dancers. So the, the Semaphore Dance Company interpreted this as a choreographic score. Chris Brunel did this kind of Ulipo text um, sound poetry piece that was m mind boggling, where he, he actually mashed. Aristotle's metaphysics against my metaphysics of notation, and he made this whole incredible text that went along with an eight-minute scrolling version of my score. And then we had five visual artists drawing um, with co photocopies of the metaphysics of notation on amplified tablets, you know, desks, and they were like extending my metaphysics of notation and elaborating on it like the way a jazz improviser would. And all those sounds were distributed spatially, and so all the sounds of the pencil and stuff like that. And so that kind of thing, like I had not heard that before. So, so these, uh, so no, it hasn't, it, so it keeps changing for me, but not because of, because of other people with their open minds, open hearts, and their generosity, uh, a willingness generosity, and a creative uh, spirit generosity. Here's a close up you can see a little bit. I'll tell you secretly, especially because here we are at 1750, and I have a bunch of these things called 1750 Arch Records with Kanla Nankaro's music. And this is a this is a little bit of an homage to him, nobody knows this. But here's a little cannon that looks like kind of punched holes. You'll see that this top row is the same as this, except, you know, yeah, anyway. Uh, the notation have has also migrated onto wristwatches. So I've been making these kind of pieces where I have these custom wristwatches made with like these um, designs. 
Um, here's one with like this. This was for an opera in Munich with the international phonetic alphabet. And here was one for the Meridian Arts Ensemble and a few other designs. And so the players follow the second hand. And as they pass over these various glyphs, they respond accordingly. Um, the I want to mention this because I, I got a chance to work with um, the Merce Cunningham Dance Company on two occasions, first in 1993, um, and I'll come back to that in a second. And then later I got to work, uh, do another, compose another event with my uh, Stanford freshman seminar students. We, I did the seminar on John Cage, and they went nuts with it. You know, they <laughs> learned about preparing piano, and they, they kind of went a little bit overboard with that. But this first wristwatch piece comes from that first, uh, from the second collaboration with Merce Cunningham that I did. And the players are playing only stones. Everyone is equipped with a pair of stones or rocks. And they're just tapping or rubbing the rock in coordination with this, the, the score, which is on their hand. I just wanted the sound of this like tapping and rubbing of stones, this large ensemble doing this while the dancers were doing their thing. This is a really kind of simple, resource. This is not an expensive instrument. This is pretty readily available in most places in the world. And this brings us to another kind of autonomy that I wanted to mention, which is what I'll call resource autonomy. So you can have autonomy with a certain kind, a number of factors. One is the sort of do-it-yourself ethos. So not waiting for other people to set up the opportunities for you to make music. You sort of make them yourself. Uh, you use the resources that are available to you, you try to expand that palette or that reservoir a little bit, but you don't say like, well, because I don't have a reservoir that's like this, I'm just crippled and I just can't uh, make any be expressive at all. So I think in some ways, do it yourself. Stones, not pipe organs. Um, you know, we don't always have eight channels of audio laying around. You know, there are some rooms that have that affordance, that's great, but what do you do when you don't have access to that? Um, friends, not orchestras. Um, what if, you know, if the Berlin Philharmonic calls me and says, we'd like to do like a retrospective, a week long retrospective of your work, I'm going to like take that phone call, right? But like, while, and, but while, the, while they're not calling, and by the way, they haven't yet, um, <laughs> I might like, I might have like a few friends who might indulge me and I might be able to do something with them. I can probably like make them dinner as a thank you or something, you know what I mean? So it's like, that's part of this sort of resource autonomy. Um, where do you perform it? If you have a living room, and some of us are lucky to have one, then you could ju do something there. You don't have to wait till, you know, Carnegie Hall or Lincoln Center um, invite you. Self-produced work, not commissioned. So you don't have to wait until somebody pays you. Now, this is a trick, and I say this from a position of privilege that I'd like to acknowledge, which is I have a day job, a tenured day job. So it's easy for me to do that. But when I didn't, I was still making... I was still self-producing work. I was just making work on my own, and I wasn't waiting to be paid for that work. This one, Friends, I think is really important. And so in some ways, I could call this, instead of resource autonomy, I could mention community autonomy. And I'll just tell two quick anecdotes about two people who've been really important in my community. Uh, both of them happen to be percussionists. Stephen Schick is an incredible person to work with. He's like done some of the most amazingly prestigious big things in the world with big resources and technology and, and human resources and so forth, but he's willing to just do the smallest, simplest things too. And I love the way he rolls that way. When I invited him once to Stanford many years ago, I said, Steve, I'm really gonna be embarrassed. Like we don't have all of the great percussion instruments that you are accustomed to at UCSD. And you know, and I'm, I'm a little bit nervous that you're gonna find what we have substandard. And he looked at me very seriously, he said, I play exclusively <laughs> what's available. And so this is like a person I want in my world. This is the kind of community, this is the person you want to be stuck with on a deserted island or something like that, right? And I love that, that, that thing. And here's this guy, Terry Longshore, who is a grad student uh, colleague of mine. He teaches now at uh, Southern Oregon University in Ashland. And he'll say to me, I've got a project, are you in? And I'll say, yeah. And then after that, I'll ask another question, which is, what's the project? <laughs> There's not many people, if you can find one person, or if you have multiple people, that's great, but if you can find one person in your life with whom you can sequence things in that way, you want to do something, yeah, I'm in. I, I, I trust you. You are so cool and so interesting and it's so exciting and so life-affirming to make music with you. I'm in on the project. 
you, you'll let me know what it is later. You know, as opposed to like, uh, I don't know if I want to commit, you know, which I am with most people, by the way. But if you can find more than zero people in your life with whom you have this relationship, that's a kind of community uh, resource, I think, that's kind of amazing. Okay, so resource autonomy. We can still ask, is this even desirable? Do we want these things? Not necessarily, right? We can ask the question, does such autonomy resist aesthetic corruption? I'm thinking specifically of this idea of self-produced work, because I think that there is this idea notionally that if you're being, um, and it doesn't have to be literally paid, if it doesn't have to be like an exchange thing in that regard, but if you're, if somebody is requesting work from you, that it somehow uh, may corrupt some notional, maybe mythological, but some notional idea of the autonomous, this is getting Marcus to think, but this autonomous uh, artistic expression that you have some sort of inner need to, to make, and that you're d deforming that, that and that, that's, a, that's to be trusted, that kind of artistic impulse, and you're corrupting that impulse as soon as you enter into a relationship, and especially one that fits under the rubric of a, of a commission. You know, but maybe this doesn't actually free me. I wonder, does it actually free me from unscrutinized constraints that prohibit the pursuit of some true artistic agenda? Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it actually presents its own interesting constraints that are very valuable and are actually at the locus of the creative in impulse. That in fact, the commission is the space that you gleefully enter into, not only because you can pay the rent, but because it presents a certain kind of pressure. You experience that resistance and you navigate it in an artistic way. Um, Here's another question. Or is artistic agency diminished by such circumscription? Like maybe you want pipe organs, or you want ear cam, or you want the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, which, you know, like throws subatomic particles at each other, and like most of us don't have one of those in our living room. You know what I'm saying? So you, might, you can get stones, that's cool, but maybe you need a particle accelerator, or you need a pipe organ, or you need fancy schmancy ear cam stuff or something. You know, maybe esoteric resources enable valuable artistic capacity. So maybe that is a good thing. All I know is that I tend to trust the value of this. So when in doubt, I feel that I can be, I feel that I can exercise my agency, my, a kind of more intrinsic and available agency, and I can be creatively puissant with starting from an idea, a recognition that I, that there's value in the autonomy that comes from this kind of res the, the do-it-yourself orientation and the leaning on friends and not worrying about getting a commission. Does that make sense? Privileged white male gainfully employed man says that that's the okay, case. <laughs> um, a lot of the things I've been sharing with you are kind of indeterminate works. I do write determinate works, and I'm going to play one of I, I have six pieces that I'm kind of excited to present to you tonight in the concert here at 8 o'clock, uh, and I'm not going to talk about them uh, in this talk except for one, and that's this piece, Aphasia, which is a piece for hand gestures synchronized to two-channel audio, and, I'm and it's terrifying for me to play. I'm going to perform it tonight because, like, there's a right and a wrong way to play it. Um, it's, like, quite determinate. This, all the audio that you hear is um, exclusively made from computer-manipulated recordings of the human voice. So there's no synthesis involved here. It's all just the human voice, but warped and mangled in the computer in various ways. Here's an excerpt from it so you get a sense of what that's about. <laughs>
you don't remember what the next chord is, you can actually work out intellectually, you know? <laughs> right? But there's no reason, there's like no laws of physics or, or cultural prompts that say, well, you know, after a Rubik's Cube should come saw board. You know, because we find ourselves constantly as humans. This is a really, you know, if just kinesthetically, just muscle memory, you know, it's like really hard to remember this stuff. So this is what I'm visualizing in my mind. It's a stereo score, but I just have reduced it to a single uh, mono uh, depiction for the amplitude for the waveform. I've imposed these uh, unreasonable tempo changes and mixed meter things and so forth. And then I tried to describe the audio in some way in the score. And then here you have what the player does. This is two systems, by the way. In the stop system, you see that there's right hand and left hand, just like where you would expect it on sort of a piano notation, but I've added a middle hand, which is a middle thing with both hands. So this portion here was thread needle, which looks like this, and then genie three times. Do you remember this? A little bit? And then we have chatterbox, flick marble, again, chatterbox, left turn, dip quill, dip quill, dip quill, shoulder touch, and then the bottom line here, pray, I poke, rock, give me money, genie again, page turn, dip quill, shoulder touch, air to air missile, stop, tea party, karate chop, towel snap, then it goes left turn, dumbbell curl, chain light, dart throw, breast stroke, and then I stop there, and we'll work on to the next page. And so I'm trying to remember these things. Part of what helps me are these mnemonics and these little, you know, I mean, I name these things. So like, when I do, when I do like give me money, this is not like, oh yeah, Mark's piece is about capitalism or something. <laughs> it's not, I'm just interested in like, what does it look like with the hand outstretched like this? So I call it give me money, it helps me remember. And uh, what else? You have dip quill. I just think this is an interesting shape. You know, so it's, but it's not like about like, oh, um, uh, <laughs> antique um, writing implements or something, it's nothing like that. Um, then there's this whole lengthy appendix, so there's pages of this, and then there's pages and pages of this, there's 123 different gestures in this absurd uh, sign language that I've invented um, that, uh, that I'm using. And by the way, there's only one, there's two places where I'm using ASL deliberately. One is this gesture, which I understand means that, I think. And then this, which is done or finished. And, but otherwise, I'm just doing all of these things that I've made up, and I'm hoping that I'm not insulting somebody's grandmother <laughs> in, you know, in like, in, um, Hindustan, in, 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 in Hindi sign language, or in Tagalog sign language, or I don't know what. Um, I'll share a few more choreographic concerns. So I continue to use some of this um, sign language stuff. It's grown to now there's some 250, 300 gestures. And uh, the Kronos Quartet commissioned a piece for me called Darmstadt Kindergarten. And what's funny is this is a picture they sent me. David was having the hardest time figuring me out. I had this thing he has to do, and I call it Etch-a-Sketch. This gesture is called etch. I wanted the I wanted the hands to do this, and I called it etch a sketch because there was this old game. Does anyone remember this? Did anyone have this as a kid? And so I I sent this to him. I'm like, God damn it! So I Amazon this thing to him, and then and so he could actually practice with it and get the idea of it. And then they sent me, the, you know, John has to do at one point shake snow globe, right? And Hank has to screw light bulb in. This is screw light bulb, and Sonny has to present flowers. And so they, and they took this picture for me with actual, like as if they procured all these things to show me that they're learning this stuff. Anyway, Darmstadt Kindergarten, it, it, this should just say string quartet, not solo string quartet. That's a little, you know, I guess. <laughs> that's an interesting thing. Um, I guess as opposed to, is it yesterday or Eleanor Rigby? One of them is a double string quartet. So, it's, it's so I don't know. Um, so here you have what the, 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 the player is doing on their instrument, but also they have an, an analog, which is another part, which is a substitute. They put their fiddle down, and then they do, in rhythmic unison with what they just played on their fiddle, they play, um, they, they, they do hand gestures. And so there's my hand gesture. Uh, so we have hero, hero pose, bus stop, choke self, evil plan, loves me not, chainsaw start. 
uh, left hand, ballpoint pen, blood pressure, apple pick, chain light, flick crumb, draw number one, uh, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. So, um, anyway, this is so, so it, but this is synchronized to what has just been played. And let me uh, let's let's find a little bit of this is actually the Jack Quartet who are doing this uh, did a very nice performance of it and uh, their memorization is great they made a nice video so let's just go for a little bit here. <laughs> I dropped you somewhere into the first minute where they're all playing together. Same minute. That's all the music that I've written. One minute of music. Here's a little transition moment. And then first violinist puts his violin down. And now they're going to play that same minute again. Stroke still. Chainsaw. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Now we're on to the next page. what happens next. Eventually, the second, we're going to repeat it a third time with two people doing. the fifth repetition of this minute long idea, you have all four players replacing their original music with this visual gesture. And the amazing thing is, and I've shorted you, you haven't heard the whole thing, but by here, by now, the audience still hears music in their heads because they've been entrained through the, uh, you know, but this rhythmic, visual rhythmic is a kind of mimesis of the remembered audio. All right, so that's a, so I just wanted to mention that some of the choreography things have persisted um, with the, the, the kind of like aphasia rhetoric. And, um, and there's also other kind of choreographic spaces. So this is a piece, Rabbit Hole, uh, that was commissioned by the San Francisco Contemporary Music Players. I think you saw this, Ed. This, yep. This, yep. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the players, there's an octet that they have it's shown by sort of red, green, and yellow stations. They each have three locations. So, um, and they're traveling among the locations. And so it's, this, it's really about like this organization of people walking from place to place. That's organized this way. So you can see here that percussion two is uh, walking to um, this, this location. Percussion three should arrive here. This is the map for the conductor to show where people are located. The dark means they're in that space. The arrow, like this, is Viola's third location. So it, it, they left this spot. They're en route to where, to this. So they're walking to here on this page. Um, and then there are these things that are eventually played, but they're played with five P's. So whenever there's actual, what we call regular music being played, it's on the edge of audibility. And there's all these instruments that are grabbed and prepared but not actually used. And th there's three levels of attentiveness. So like here is my, this is the lowest level of attentiveness. It's sort of like uh, like your, your stop sign, like 
like, uh, well, I, no, it's not like a stop, stop body. Anyway, but at the bottom, this is like in a relaxed position, like you're in an orchestra and you don't play in this movement or you have a really long passage. And then the middle dot would be like getting kind of like, okay, I have to play in like four bars or something like that. And then the top is like really, you know, like, and, and the players are deciding if this is like preparing a pizzicato that's never played or an up bow or a down bow, you know, and there's moments to like tighten the screw on the, it's all of these ancillary things. I, basically the, the piece, I, I should have said this, this piece starts with the page turns. I compose the page turns first. Everyone reads from full 180 page score for this piece. And by the way, there's two, um, what's it, verso, recto verso versions. So half the players have even numbered pages on the right and half have odd numbered pages on the right. So we don't have page turns at exactly the same place. And so anyway, it's, it's entirely organized on the basis of the um, page turns. And there are also wrist washes in this piece. Let me just, um, uh, are you guys doing OK? Mm -hmm. Yeah? What? OK, thanks. Thumbs up. That's good. I will stay. I will keep going. <laughs> um, let's see. You're going to walk out on us? Well, I just wanted to know if like, I, should, I should walk out on you to, to sort of excuse, to preempt your walking out. That's the same as a self-defensive. It's, again, all about insecurity. OK, let's. Uh, So there's the downbeat for the person. No one's playing a note. They just have all these things are like really carefully timed in terms of the time it takes to walk to various places. Every page is precisely five seconds long. And of the 180 pages, there are no two pages that are the same in terms of meter and tempo combination. So it's different. So Steve has his, the conductor, has his own kind of conduction choreography. He makes five seconds over and over again, but in many different ways in terms of the tempo, you know, and so forth. Steve has to move to another location to conduct from the side, and the second percussionist comes to the other side, so yeah, the, the players are told which person to pay attention to. Um, yeah, anyway, this is, um, there's this thing where, like, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, where, like, you have the composer who thinks that, like, everyone agrees, like, if this composer has done something to contribute to like musical culture, this is the piece that they compose that everyone thinks is kind of important and this is really a big thing. And then you sometimes have these weird things where you have this misguided composer thing where that, that composer thinks that this is the piece that is my big thing, but everyone else thinks like that's like the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> that's that for me. I really I think that there's something here, but I don't think anyone else agrees. <laughs> like they're like, just play the hand gesture piece again or something. You know what I mean? Or or just play tornado food on the piano. Um, okay, anyway, that's my personal, I don't know. I have some, I have some conviction with this. I think there's something there. Okay, but nobody else has to. That's okay. Um, there are some hybrid works um, that I'd like to mention. Uh, I'll just mention this one, Composition Machine Number 1 for Solo Percussion. The, set, the soloist plays here, the audience perspective is from the bottom looking at the player. And there's three seconds section. The player... Um, traverses, starts from a setup on the left, then the middle, then the right. The player comes onto the stage and, fi and, and finds that there's a scroll of paper on these music stands, which are actually facing the audience, so that you could see these music stands. And then, um, I wrote it initially for Terry Longshore, so I'll use the pronoun he. So he unscrolls it uh, across these, unfurls this big piece of paper across this music stand, and it's this weird pictographic notation. And then he performs on an instrumental setup of his own design, and he interprets those things. And it, and it actually has to be his own interpretation of what those signs mean, and it's got to be predetermined. It's not an improvisation, but he has determined 
what the musical sounds and physical actions are as associated with this particularly this idiomatic notation. Then, and so you have this thing in where this is echoed on in the third section too. The instrumental setup, by the way, should be different. The notation assignation is the same. So if there's a dot, dot means the same thing in section one and section three, but it, there's a different set of instruments around. Does that make sense? Okay, then you have this middle section. What happens to this middle section? So at the end of this first section, um, the player takes the score off of the stand and crumples it into this ball, like just mashes up the score on the way to this amplified table where he drops it on the table and then sources from these setup tables all these other doodads, a book and a soup canister and uh, um, soda or beer bottle tops and different things and drops them on the table at various times and it looks like this. So this is completely scripted. What you grab from the, from, the, from the table, all these different things, um, and then how you put them. And so then this whole thing gets performed. This, is, this takes like a couple minutes. And then at the end of that, I should have told you that on the table, this amplified table, so you're hitting the cool sounds of these things on there, but on the table is a piece of like long piece of paper that's taped to the table. And so then there are, at the end of this thing, he's asked to trace around the different objects. And there are very specific things, like the book, the hardcover book, has to be traced on three sides. It shouldn't be completed. And the soup can, you draw a circle in, and then you have to draw the number in right afterwards, which is the calendar date on the date that you're giving the performance. <laughs> and then you put X's where the soda bottle um, tabs have dropped as you clear them off. And there's a branch, there's a stick that you write, and then you have to have a dotted line between where the CD case was, and then you have to have a letter for the day of the week Mondays A, Tuesday B, etc. So there's all these rules, and this gets traced in under 60 seconds. Very, fa it's a cool thing to watch somebody do this, and it makes something that looks like this. This is then taken and pinned up immediately in section three on the music stand. So now we're all the way here oh, immediately. So we just put these things here, remove them, drawn, and then we take the score and put it here, and then we articulate that score. X's being the same things, curves being the same same thing, but with new set of Right? And then at the end of that, he takes this score off, he rolls it into a scroll, puts a rubber band on it, and leaves it on this stand and walks on stage. So it's circular. It's a piece that generates its own score. And to, and to, to do this piece the first time, you have to start here, right? <laughs> because you, you know, in rehearsal. Like you do this, and so and now we're ready to actually do a performance. And so here, for example, this is Alan Adi of the Cincinnati Conservatory of Music. These are two of his. Um, drawings, and you see how they're very similar in many ways. They have a lot of the same elements, but they're also a bit different. Anyway, I just thought I'd show you that. So there's a choreography. I, I would also put this in the kind of choreography category, and I do a lot of things like that. Okay, look, it's been like an hour since you played jazz piano. Can we have some more music that actually sounds like music? I mean, would it kill you to write orchestral music or maybe even a pop song? Um, you're wondering. Maybe you're not. I don't know. Um, so I thought I was just going to throw you a bone here with a couple things. So here, I, I thought to represent the idea that I actually do regular music also, uh, which I have an abiding interest in, alongside some of this uh, more ontology questioning um, types of enterprise. I wrote this piece called Scumpy Doozer, uh, which means marshmallows in Danish. It's my favorite word in any language. <laughs> in 2001, and it just was discovered for the Warsaw Autumn Festival last month and played there, and it was nice to have like a, a really good orchestra play your music. This is, of, of course I'm messing with this a little bit, because this is for orchestra and tape, it turns out, but let's just watch a few bits of this piece. <laughs> Somebody listen. 
listened to Bar Talk when he was an undergraduate. <laughs> All right. It's very cinematic, I think, in some ways. Um, but this is my like. So th that's like a impulse that like, I might, I don't, I'd like to write film music one day of like the regular story. I won't ever get to, by the way. I, but I, I probably won't. I think there's two ways of writing film music. This is very crude, I don't quite understand it. One is you have to move to Los Angeles and you have to apprentice with like, you know, Hans Zimmer or something like that. And you're like ghostwriter number 17 on some project and then you have to write a lot of cues for television shows for a and you work your way up and eventually maybe you become Hans Zimmer. It's like winning the lottery, okay? So that's one thing. And you're like probably waiting a lot of tables. It's kind of like moving to Los Angeles to become an actor, okay? It's like you might be able to do it, but probably not. So is this bleak? And, okay, anyway. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of one. And I'm too old to do that now. Type two is you're like Philip Glass, and you're like fucking famous, and then like somebody invites you to score their movie because in there it's like a kind of slightly experimental off movie something. I'm eligible for this, possibly, <laughs> but it's not, but I'm not, that's not good, you know, I'm like, like my mom thinks I'm good, but you know, it's like, <laughs> so that would be the other kind of thing, you can like wait, so I probably won't, uh, anyway, but I, I wrote that up for today, so. <laughs> Okay, um, career advice in the composition <laughs> seminar, <laughs> very luminous, very practical, not dispiriting, not soul crushing, <laughs> sorry, okay. So there's that, um, which is kind of fun. And then I also have, I've been trying to write pop songs of late, and I write like one pop song a year, maybe. Um, and I'm interested in pop songs that are not, like when most professors uh, at Augusta University say they're interested in writing pop songs, they either mean they want to be in like a jam band, like Grateful Dead or Fish or something like that, or they, want, they wish they were Radiohead, or they want to play bluegrass. And I don't know why that would be included, but anyway, that's that's usually what people think. No, I'm talking about like communing with a totally pop sensibility. Like this would be like writing a song, not for me to be an artist, that's impossible. Anyway, but like for like that um, Taylor Swift, which she's actually a pretty good composer in a lot of ways, and so she'd probably do her own music. She wouldn't do mine, but like um, you know, somebody like this would be like FM radio top pop sort of thing. That's what I'd love to do. So. Um, and I mean this kind of basic contrasting verse chorus narrative structure. When I was a student way back at Carleton College, so I've returned to the scene of the crime, by the way, with this visiting professorship, I met this guy, Johann Becker. So I was a senior in college, and he was a senior in Northfield, Minnesota High School. He was a foreign exchange student from Minnesota. This is the studio that I was hanging out and working a lot in back at the time. Um, and we, we met. This is what he looks like now. He lives in Stockholm, and he's a pretty successful not like successful Max Martin successful, like just a middle class trying to, like he's had like a huge number one K-pop hit in, in Japan and then he like paid the rent for like a year and then the next year he has like no idea if he's gonna like have a song, anyone's gonna buy a song. So it's like a, it's a very middle class trying to pay the rent kind of thing, but he's quite successful and he's worked with a lot of different artists and he came, he and his friend Frederick Tolmander, uh, who now has a studio, a great studio in Mallorca that he's built, um, they came to my rock sex and rebellion class. This is like a rock history class I teach at Stanford. And while they were there one year, I said like, I'd really like to learn how you guys do this kind of thing. And so we co-wrote a song. And that song is my first song and it's called Back Off Bitch. <laughs> and um, before you like cancel me, um, the the, it's, it is problematic, it's a, he but it's a heteronormative breakup song, but the guy is the bitch. And so that's, so I somehow felt like that gives me a little bit of cover. <laughs> and um, he's like the villain. And this is from like the woman's, so it's like a, it's a song written for a woman. And you're t I'm told that when you make one of these, and I'll play just a little bit of our demo, you're supposed to imagine what artist you're thinking, you're writing for, and it, it could be that artist or a person like that. And I was thinking of Pink, like a very strong, outspoken uh, female voice. So let me play you just a little bit of Back Off Bitch, and you can hear. And it started because I was starting to learn how to play electric guitar, and I came up with this, like, a guitar riff, and then 
um, Johann and Frederick, and I told this story about how, that's a funny story, anyway, that ends up with the words back off fish. Um, this is, I, I guess I now I have to tell you. <laughs> so I had, I gave this uh, lyric assignment uh, when I was younger a long time ago in this class, and everybody had to write a set of lyrics, and I got one set of lyrics from a student that were, and you'll laugh and you won't be able to believe this, like how could this possibly happen, and I, I wonder myself. But it was like really like some serious infatuation lyrics. Like they were writing like a crazy love letter to me, and it wasn't ironic or sarcastic. It was like just deeply troubling, and it was very weird, and it was very awkward. And so my wife wrote a response lyric that went, back off, bitch, you've crossed the line. Back off, bitch, the prof is mine. <laughs> I, read, I read that in class. There's like 200 students. And I don't know. And to, then I didn't know. And to this day, I don't know who that student is because I covered the, when I read, when I grade, I cover the name. So I'm not trying to be biased, right? So I don't, I don't know who that student was. Um, but like, I read that and the students cracked up and laughed and I never got, it. like, I, it, it worked. Okay, <laughs> sorry, most people don't know that anecdote. Um, but, so I told that story and then I played this guitar riff and Johan and Frederick, after like some gin and tonics were hanging out, they're like, that's back off bitch, let's work on that. And so that was the, that was the co-write moment where it's like, okay, we got a concept, then we switched the gender, it's not about a professor or anything like that. Okay, <laughs> sorry, too much information, here we go. <laughs> summer phenomenon. That's what that one is. Um, so like I'm trying on these different sorts of things, right? And um, that's kind of fun. There are some, clearly some issues of appropriation and authenticity maybe that are relevant. Okay, anyway, but the point is, if we think about this song and we have a continuum from like good to, from bad to good, like the worst song ever to the best song ever, Back Off Pitch is like somewhere in the middle, or maybe there, or somewhere in this space. It's certainly not one of the best songs. I don't think it's the worst song that's ever been written. Okay, if we take like aphasia, all of the, the, the worst hand gesture synchronized to two channel audio ever to the best hand gestures synchronized, you know, it's like, how do you assess that? Where do you, where do you, where do you come in on that? You know, it could be anywhere in here. And so this is, again, this idea of autonomy. I'm returning to this first kind of, um, uh, cultural autonomy. There's joy and peril in both of these enterprises of doing things, you know, where no one's done it before, in a sense, and they're immediately both the best and the worst. So the affordance is great. You get to invent this cool thing, but you still do have to understand how it works to try to actually put forth. I actually really worked hard. I spent close to a year trying to write a really good hand gesture synchronized to two channel audio piece. Even though I don't, even though it's impossible to know where it would stand. I just imagine if there were multiple pieces, I want mine to be somewhere over here on this end of the table. Okay. Is the new better? I wonder. Because like I do seem to be like back off bitch, obviously deliberately um, derivative, right? Communing with an extant popular monoculture in many ways. So is the new better? Because that's where I spend the most of my time. 
I can even ask, are progress and tradition enemies? Are they even opposites? I'm not sure. In some ways, if I were to turn this into an adjective, I could put traditional here. And the opposite is not progressive. It's probably just simply untraditional. I would put progressive, I would ally it in this column with untraditional. And then maybe, depending on what we're talking about, maybe we'd be talking about conservative. So traditional and conservative might go together to me. It depends on the sphere of human life that we're discussing. But I kind of, if I'm making columns, I'm going to put these words in a left column or a right column together. If I take convention, I'm going to put conventional on the left and unconventional on the right. Are you with me on this? Okay, quotidian, versus like very everyday, versus exceptional, typical versus extraordinary, mainstream versus marginal, exoteric versus esoteric, customary versus alternative, orthodox versus iconoclastic or heterodox, accepted versus speculative. Clearly, these are not synonyms in each column that mean precisely the same things. I'm trying to build, just verbally, build two sort of value pools or two sort of spaces of operating. Inherited versus inventive, established, hypothetical, certain versus uncertain, old versus new, of course, classic versus modern, familiar versus foreign, normal versus abnormal, and because I've run out of space, uh, we'll just stop with conforming versus adherent or deviating. Some of these words have certain kinds of valences in terms of their desirability. So exceptional is usually, not always, but usually a pretty good thing. We kind of want things that are exceptional. Abnormal, not always a bad thing, but often is pejorative, I think. Whereas alternative is comparatively neutral, I think. I mean, it's, you don't really know. We have words like uncertain, which are negative to most people, but are super positive to me. This is a space I want to live, and I love people who want to live there with me in uncertainty. I think this is actually a really, uh, frankly, I think it's a socially and politically viable and ethical place to be, but I also think that it's artistically a really interesting place to live. Um, let's take familiar versus foreign for a second. I want to hit you with a triptych of quotes. Scott Ashton says, we are wired to reject new things or at least be suspicious of them. When something is new, our hippocampus finds few matching memories. It signals unfamiliarity to our amygdalae which gives us feelings of uncertainty. Uncertainty is an aversive state. We avoid it if we can. So there seems to be some sort of hardwired uh, inclination to avoid uncertainty. So I think that's actually something to overcome as our species. Uh, Derek Thompson says, our brains are wired to prefer melodies we already know. Familiar songs are easier to process, and the less effort needed to think through something, whether a song, a painting, or an idea, the more we tend to like it. In psychology, this is ideas known as fluency. When a piece of information is consumed fluently, it neatly slides into our patterns of expectation, filling us with satisfaction and confidence. And then maybe Branford Marcellus says it best, and most concisely, you don't know what you like, you like what you know. So in many respects, I think that our job as humans and as members of uh, various overlapping communities is to try to know more things and to experience more things. So I think there's just a kind of an exposure and open-mindedness and open-heartedness I know this is very woozy and sort of sick. I'm in Berkeley. I'm going to go with this. <laughs> but I think this is like a really good state that we should be in. And um, yeah, I'll leave it there. There's more things to say about that. But let's revisit autonomy. So there was this cultural autonomy, the culture of one, that I was extolling. And this is in many respects based on what I think of as what I'm calling an experimentalist creed, which is an aspiration to succeed, but a willingness to fail in service of new insight. Uh, you don't get to you don't get applauded for failing, but getting a new insight in the film industry. By the way, you <laughs> don't usually get co uh, in commissions. Often, people don't want you to fail. You know, there's well, let's put this. There's there's only a few commissions you get where the commissioner is very proud of you failing, <laughs> but you learn something. Interesting. But this is like <laughs> this. I think is actually really a, a a vital kind of place to exist. But is it desirable? In some ways, uh, we can think of the discursive loss in a culture of one. So if you're, who do you discuss this with? Who do you communicate with if you're in your own kind of bubble in your own space? I think of Henry Louis Gates' idea of signification, something that is very important often in African-American communities where, where um, if we were, by contrast, if we think of a kind of Eurocentric, a white Eurocentric, and by the way, I'm essentializing here, apologies for these generalizations, if you have a certain kind of European, white, mid-century modernist idea that formal invention, formal innovation is the be-all and end-all of like the genius moment. 
in many respects, you have in some minority cultures, often diasporic cultures, and I'm going to specifically single out the Black American experience, which is not my story to tell, but I do want to, uh, I do want to share this uh, story. I think it's important. You have a virtue in in using received extant forms that there is something that is considered important and virtuous in personalizing, adding your own elaborations and personalizations to something received. So if I'm playing a 12 bar blues, nobody complains like, oh, you didn't invent the 12 bar blues. They're actually, they're actually applauding the fact that I'm using a known familiar formula, a structure, and I'm creating my own personalizations and elaborations on that. When somebody raps and they have a story to tell and they're doing amazing linguistic verbal pyrotechnics with interesting rhymes and clever expressions and so forth, you don't sit there and say like, yeah, well, that's 4-4. Four, four. You didn't invent 4-4. Four, four. You know, it's like, <laughs> the point is there, you have certain kinds of spaces where you have a continuity of community and through a shared structural framework. And so my culture of one destroys that, it, or destroys some, much of that. It erases that. So you can actually have a, con in a sense, back off bitch is a conversation in the pink cultural space, whereas aphasia has very little to talk to, talk with, talk about, if that makes sense. So there is a discursive loss. I just want to ident identify this as I complicate our ideas about what kinds of autonomy are desirable, what we get from them, what are the losses. At the same time, there is a kind of opportunity lost if you have fealty, if you have over-loyalty to some sort of tradition. I think there's a kind of myopia. You have a certain kind of blindness if you're stuck doing things the way that you were taught to do, if you're stuck doing things the way that was the received tradition, if you follow your teachers exactly. You know, there's a certain kind of blind sight. In, 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 in an era where we come out of, like, the, the last, the prior four years with the Trump administration, I'm not going to be somebody who's going to be in favor of ignorance. So this is a complicated thing, and I want to make it clear. I'm not interested in you not knowing things. But I have to say, by knowing things, this is my instinct, we are unable to have certain kinds of insights. It's a, this is a weird kind of paradox. So we need to know more things, but at the same time, we have to be aware that that knowledge potentially makes us blind two things, things that, like, say, somebody like Kuhn would call a paradigm shift, where we can actually move over to a completely different way of doing things and drop the, the old thing. He calls, he dismissively refers to normal science as the science that you got to go through until you get to the paradigm shift, where suddenly it's like things look a completely different way. So back to this idea, you know, Picasso might support Gates, and he would say, like, let's learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. But this word pro is in there, and I, I want to be a little skeptical of that. Robert Fripp once said, the concern of the musician is music. The concern of the professional musician is business. If that's the case, I have no interest in being professional, frankly. So I'm not so sure that that whole sort of like professionalism that sort of connects to doing it the way that you're supposed to do it, um, or that you have to do it that way first before you're entitled to break the rules. Like, look, look at infants and toddlers. They're exploring their rural world very creatively. They're breaking rules. There are some rules they can't break, like gravity and so forth. But they're like they're they're not subject to some of these things. And I think that kind of unprofessionalism is possibly quite he healthy creatively. Um, George Saunders, to defend this side again, says what ages poorly it seems are ideas that trend to the clever, the new, or the merely personal. What gets dated somehow is that which is too ego-inflated, that which hasn't been out, held up against the old wisdom. So maybe there is something, the old wisdom. I mean, the old wisdom tells me about like the blue scale, and I used it in tornado food. So that's kind of cool. I'm like communing with jazz history. Well, Chuck Klosterman writes, tells of autodidact Eddie Van Halen, who insists that had he taken proper guitar lessons, he would have never developed the innovative techniques that are now regularly taught by proper guitar instructors. So, you know, we have that side of the argument. Let's have, let's give John Cage the last quote where he actually occupies both sides in the single quote. He says, once in Amsterdam, a Dutch musician said to me, it must be very difficult for you in America to write music for you are so far away 
from the centers of tradition. <laughs> and Cage said, I have to say, it must be very difficult for you in Europe to write music. You are so close to the centers of tradition, which is kind of an interesting thing. I want to add a, a little technology, uh, 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 on technological autonomy, kind of a bonus rant here. So if we imagine like a continuum where on the left you have less control and on the right you have more control, I'm thinking of like your tools. My teachers always told me that like these were aligned with less originality and creativity. So you want to have more control because then you could be more original and more creative and arguably more autonomous. So you'd have more technological autonomy if you had more control. What is this spot of more control? What is this place on this continuum? Well, let's start here because if you press the commercial keyboard demo song button, I would argue you don't have a lot of control. That's just <laughs> pressing the button or not. And there's not a lot of originality and creativity. Here. I can imagine there is some moment where pressing it could be a creative act. But for the most part, we'd say that's not super creative. Look, if you knew how to compose your own melody, you could be, you know, if you had that extra tool, you could be more autonomous. You could have, you could do something more personalized. That would be more creative. Well, you should also learn how to like tweak the synthesizer. You don't want like the store patch that's like the king with the out of the box. Let's move the filter settings or something like that. Well, wait, we should really write the synthesizer code. We should learn how to do that because now you really can make your own instrument. You're more autonomous. You're being more creative and more original. Well, you know what? There's actually a lot of assumptions that are baked into like an operating system. So I think really to be creative, and I'm sure Ed teaches you all this also, you really have to write your own. UC Berkeley students are, I presume, responsible for writing their own. Even if you're like writing a paper, you don't use like Microsoft Word or something. You, <laughs> you, you write your own operating system because that's going to give you more expressive capacity. Um, well, no, we should really be building our own computers. You know what? It'd be better if we could design our own microchips. So I think we should all spend a lot of time learning how to do that. And finally, you get here. This is digging silicon <laughs> out of the ground. So look, there would be a cost. So is this what it takes to be creative? Do I have to move it? Can I not make some interesting creative decisions using like MIDI? <laughs> or I don't know. <laughs> there are certain things you can do. There's a kind of a cost of all of this. So I think that, um, anyway, that's just a little bit of a rant that I have. And these people all just, you know, on <laughs> <laughs> their journey. So. Thank you. <laughs> okay, this guy says that I gotta bring it home um, and think about ABBA. Okay, not that ABBA, but rather the schematic ABBA, where we first heard some jazz. We didn't hear this piece, we heard tornado food. And then we looked at my sound sculptures, and we looked at a whole bunch of different experimental pieces, and finally we heard a pop song. And so I'm calling these different types of things A's and B's. Let's separate them. The A's are kind of vernacular uh, musical enterprise that I do, like playing jazz and pop music. I've actually put Skunky Doozer in this category too. It's not what most people would call vernacular music, but it's kind of like contemporary new music idioms that are well rehearsed and are very familiar to people. Um, I'm going to rename this consumption for a weird reason that I'm hoping will become clear in a second. And then we have the non-vernacular stuff. I'm going to rename this experimentation. So I have this basic divide here, and this gets me to the moral dilemma that I promised you at the outset. First, let me define these a little more. Experimentation, for me, this is now getting very personal. This is not something that I expect other people to agree with. For me, it feels like a genuine contribution to a discourse and the feeling that if I don't make these works, no one else will. So that's why I feel like an experimentalist when I'm doing that. When I'm on this side and I'm writing a pop song or I'm playing a 12 bar blues, I feel that it's kind of a creativity as a kind of guilty pleasure. The world is already lousy with this kind of art. I don't think the world needs me to write a pink-like song and I don't think the world needs another jazz tune from me, right? So I feel in a weird way like a kind of guilty pleasure. It's a pleasure I like to do, I'm gonna continue doing, but it doesn't feel like a contribution in the same way. Uh, on the experimental side, there is a risk of failure, moreover, an ability to assess success. How do we know if we're doing it well? On the consumption side, there's the pleasure and cachet of communing with functional, proven culture. We all know how the, what the rules are in these things. On the experimental side, there's a kind of marginal expression, I'm misunderstood, or more likely simply ignored. 
On the consumptive side, it's a sort of mainstream expression. I am understood, and there's a pleasure in that. On the experimentation side, a personal invented discipline, it's actually in service of a kind of progress or iconoclasm. Particularly for me, it's very much a kind of tricks and gimmicks, I realize, but for me, it's a genuine interest in putting pressure on the ontological definitions, the boundaries of music. This is a kind of instinct. And then on the consumption side, a traditional discipline in service of conservation, or maybe merely yeoman evolution. Folks, I have allied these in my mind, and I don't expect you to identify with this, but I've allied experimentation with a kind of giving and consumption with a kind of taking. I feel like I'm taking from the world when I'm working in those sort of, when I'm writing a filmic cinematic orchestra piece or a pop song. I feel like I'm giving, granted, a gift that most people don't want <laughs> when I'm writing a piece for three conductors and no players. I feel like I'm calibrated to see and give that to a kind of discursive cultural space. So if we remove the word experimentation, we can actually re replace this with philanthropy versus consumption. And we can say that philanthropy is characterized by an altruism guided by an aspiration to moral decency and its action often characterized by sacrifice. Brace yourself for the next sentence. It's a bit grotesque, but it's really true. It's, I think it's a true statement and it really captures what I feel here. I don't need a second kidney. I could be donating a second kidney to somebody who, there are people who need, that don't have one functional kidney. So this is a, a way of very boldly kind of suggesting what I mean about this side. On the consumption side, it's characterized by leisure and recreation, motivated by hedonism. I identify as a hedonist. It's enterprise often characterized by self-interest and self-indulgence. And to contrast that statement, I don't need a second kidney, let me put this out here. I would enjoy a second flat screen television, you know, also true. So like, but these are like worlds apart. In the, in the sense uh, of time, on the philanthropic side, I could ask how much time do I have for others. On the consumption side, we could ask how much time do I have for myself. So really what we have here is like the idea of this giving and taking is not me versus me. And I think all of us are trying to figure out how to harmonize these things as we try to live an ethical life. And what I'm trying to point out here is that the pretty vast, unruly terrain of my musical output, my musical creativity that wants to go here and wants to go there and wants to go here and so forth, I've started to organize it around these with a kind of ethical backdrop. And again, this is about me. This is not, and, and furthermore, your idea of experimentation is different than the person sitting next to you's idea of experimentation. And your idea of what giving constitutes is different maybe than the person sitting next to you. So I, again, I just want to make sure I'm not trying to export this to anyone else. This is just sharing some thoughts that I have, how there's a moral dilemma that has emerged about the backdrop of which the scaffolding, the subtext, is something we all think about, which is how to live a moral life. And it's weirdly mapped onto the, the, the terrain of my musical output. Here is a map of musical culture. It is an excerpt and it is not a scale. So here is this space. What's in there? These are pieces with lyri lyri uh, lyrical melodies. I ask myself when I think about that space in the world, like I imagine this is a huge box. I say, are there any examples? Do we have any lyrical melodies already in the world? Has anyone ever made a lyrical melody? And I noticed, yeah, a lot. And there, there's like a fuckload of pieces with lyrical melodies that we probably don't need anymore, at least not from you. I mean, you don't even really care about lyrical melodies, okay? But I still might want to write a piece that has a lyrical melody, and guess what? It's gonna go in this box. This, is, this box is already overflowing. I'm gonna throw something else in the box. I don't care, screw it. I wanna write a piece of lyrical. Okay, what about this? These are pieces about syncopation. I look in there, are there any examples? Yeah, a whole lot of pieces of syncopation, but I, say, I, say, I might want to do that. What is this? Quarter tone pieces, done, been done, solo, violin, extended technique, spectral harmonies. So I'm looking at all these spaces, and there's a lot of these bins with a lot of examples in there already. This is just how I think about things in my own compositional metabolism. And then I notice this space. Whoa, what is that? These are pieces for florist and orchestra. And I noticed there's, that's an empty box. There are no examples of pieces for florist and or orchestra, and quite possibly for a very good reason. But I just feel like I, my the way my antennae are tuned are such that I, I can see that box. And some people don't, can't see it. it. It may not be a virtue to be able to see it, but I have a compulsion to see it. 
And so I feel like I have to write a piece for that. It's like a dirty job, but you are the composer for it. And by dirty job, I mean it's artistically dubious, culturally ignorable, and critically opaque. And then I notice this. These are pieces for three conductors and no players. And then I look, what's this box? Oh, pieces with wrist rust notations. And this is instruments made of junk. And this is pieces that generate their own score. And so I start looking at this terrain and trying to figure out, like, where, where are these other spaces for me to operate? Where are these other spaces for me to make what I feel are kind of contributions, sort of explorations of sorts? And um, I'm just going to evade the fact that there is a kind of uncomfortable, almost imperial or colonial sort of subtext, the way this feels like I'm planting a flag in some virgin territory. But I'm just going to ignore that. Um, so. It's not, I mean, at first it sort of seems like, okay, this is the area where I should be working and that's not available to me. That's not true. I'm still working on the right side of this line because it's hedonism that I can enjoy as opposed to a kind of a good, as I see it, that I can do. Now, this is, of course, too simplistic, especially if you think about, like, you ask the question, what is this space? So let's look at this bucket. What's in there? Well, these are pieces with hand gestures, and then I make a fascia in 2010. But guess what this is over here? This is the same bucket, pieces with hand gestures, but it's Darmstadt Kindergarten five years later. It's no longer experimental for me. It's already something that's familiar. So I feel like this is a kind of contribution in a way that this isn't. Again, in my head. And that's because here's a bit of the super long, I, I have these things organized in spreadsheets and stuff like that, all of my hand gestures and so forth. Maybe I should add some more words to this map as I bring things to a close here. Maybe this is more on the left more about progress I can make versus tradition in which I can revel. Maybe it's codes I can invent versus rules on which I can lean. Maybe it's habits I can overcome versus customs I can conserve. Maybe there are foreign message margins I can investigate. Or maybe it's valuable to have familiar orthodoxies and to accept them. Maybe there are new theories that I can devise. And maybe there are extant theories upon which I can expound. Maybe there's uncertainty I can explore versus doubts I can ignore. So this is a kind of a, uh, an update, uh, progress report, where I'm at as, as a composer. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you've thought of me, I think, as a professor. It's then I get a little bit more <laughs> as a confessor of sorts. Um, Charles asks, what about the yes. hammers? So um, the hammers are this uh, a Canadian artist um, named Roger McKay, who uh, made these really cool hammers. These are in my studio at home in Menlo Park. And there's this Maslow's adage about, like, to a person who has only a hammer, all the world looks like a nail. That's a creatively, uh, that's not a useful space to be in, I think. So I think we want to have all sorts of tools. We want to have tools that are, um, that are about consumption, and we want to have tools that are about experimentation, or any of the other kinds of ways that you can break down the terrain that I've suggested today. Any, in any case, I like this. It reminds me that if we are going to have just a hammer, let's have some really weird fucked up hammers <laughs> in different ways. So I would like to thank you all for your attention. Um, I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Uh, questions or complaints, but first I should mention something else that I have a little coda here, which is that I'm a member of the SIMAT Advisory Council, which was convened in two, which was started in 2016, and to my knowledge, never convened. <laughs> so, um, but I do have some ideas, and so at least fall into technical, <laughs> curricular, extracurricular, <laughs> and adjunct faculty appointment initiative, infrastructure, and what I call liability and risk management. So, first, I think you guys really need a dry ice to MIDI converter, and specifically the one with the rotisserie attachment. I think all this, like, ambisonic stuff, we should just throw it away, and then we should really make sure you get a dry ice to MIDI converter. On the curricular side, <laughs> Maybe there should be like a 100 gex autotune clinic, or I'm thinking of a required six course sequence on the Nyquist. <laughs> and this would not just be for, this is like undergraduates, this is like a liberal arts thing, this is not like a music major thing, it's just like, it's especially music majors who are like, I think, in the piano and strings uh, area. Uh, Maybe Taco Tuesday could be a good idea. And I'm also thinking of an Ed Champion beer trip. <laughs> and when I first, 
When I first wrote this down, I was thinking that you would learn how to trim your beard like Ed, but then I started thinking, no, it's just people taking turns working on Ed's beard themselves. Um, and then I just, Barbara Lee is a treasure. Why don't you just hire her? She's just amazing. Uh, you, it's, it's kind of a costly outlay, but I think you should just start working on the ear camera. <laughs> like, we should just get that going, because it will ultimately be, I think, a very cost-effective thing. <laughs> and then, here's an initiative that I just called the uh, Sinmat Hazmat, because I'm a little worried about potential lawsuits and things, so that's just something to think about. Uh, yeah, that's it for now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark, for such a nice talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you uh, for having me. So I guess we may have many questions, but maybe we can kind of have a kind of something to eat or drink and then have the questions uh, together and discuss. Okay? Sounds good. Okay. 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 Thank you.